It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to return to where I wrote this last book on the scholarship in the digital age. Uh, the first draft was written on sabbatical at the Oxford Internet Institute and uh, worked with our wonderful colleagues here at, um, at the time. I started working on some of the empirical questions in the oh, about 10 years ago, and it led me to really pull together where data was becoming such a key part of scholarship. So as Paul said, he and Dave and a number of us sort of early in the e-science, e-social science, uh, cyber infrastructure investigations began to look at these. And I thought it was a good topic for a keynote for this meeting because it's one that has perhaps changed or ramped up most aggressively in the course of the 10 years of the Oxford Internet Institute. And I want to convince you in the next 25 minutes or so that it's going to be one of the most exciting and challenging areas for Internet research in the next 10 years of the Oxford Internet Institute for the rest of us. <laughs> this metaphor, the data deluge, goes back uh, to early e-science. I think the Tony Hay and Antra Fethen, again, here at Oxford, were the first to coin the term and really write, start writing papers about it. What's um, fascinating is that on the one hand, you've got far more data being generated by highly instrumented science, social science on the internet and other places, and yet much of that data really is runoff. I mean, that this metaphor works in that sense. Very little of it is being captured, relatively little of it is being curated or shared or used or reused. And that's why I put this notion of this imperative to share data, because actually not a whole lot of it is, is getting shared. So selecting what's worth keeping, uh, by whom, for whom, and how is among the questions that we're facing. And it's not for lack of attention. This is just a small sampling of the policy reports that have appeared in the US and the UK in the last 10 years about infrastructure and about data. And look at these titles. Long Live Digital Data Collections Enabling Research and Education in the 21st Century, Harnessing the Power of Digital Data, Dealing with Data. These uh, topics here have covered social practices, infrastructure, technology, and a whole variety of policy and economic issues. As you can imagine, there is not much consensus amongst these reports, or this would be much more of a solved problem than it is right now. On the U.S. side of the pond, the elephant in the room is the National Science Foundation data management plans. This first part, the highlighting is mine, just to call your attention to some key phrases. The NSF data sharing policy has been part of all, contra all research contracts for at least a decade, perhaps much longer. But they did not enforce that particular requirement. In fact, I suspect that most NSF investigators had no idea they were committing to that by getting a grant. What's new is this second statement beginning in January of 2011, all new proposals have to include a two-page data management plan. And that plan goes through peer review, which is not all funding agencies are doing that. So to get your grant reviewed, you have to say what are your data and what you're going to do about them. If, however, you read closely in these plans, you find that every single directorate of NSF is, is implementing it differently, even down to level of some different divisions are implementing it. Um, overall, there is not a clear sense of what's meant by data, what's meant by management, or even what's meant by plan. <laughs> Investigators and librarians are running around crazy trying to figure out how to respond to this requirement. Uh, the Digital Curation Center in Britain has posted a number of data management planning documents for the UK agencies, and they're starting to support some of them for the US agencies. It's no uh, less muddy here on this side of the pond. Welcome Trust, which is the largest funder of biomedical research in uh, the UK, 
was among the very first to have some kind of data sharing policies. And notice some of the things here I've highlighted. Uh, we expect our funded researchers to maximize access to their data, few restrictions as possible. I particularly like this one in the middle. Data that holds significant value as a resource, if, that, if you claim that, then you have to submit a data management plan. So, so you can either claim your data are really important, then you have to write the plan, or you can claim they're not important, and then why should they fund your research? So there's all kinds of, you know, wiggle room in here, and then they say their policy aligns with these other organizations. The ESRC is among the most interesting. They have some other policies I haven't put up here about the actual curation and about who has, who has the authority to say whether the data should be kept, and there's even an interesting clause about proving that nobody else has done the research, there's no other data you can use before you can get funded. They're the only ones who have tried to do that, and that raises an amazing number of infrastructure questions. Uh, but they refer to the OECD guidelines saying that publicly funded data are a public good, and then they're one of the few that refers to the preservation and the management and the secondary data analysis questions. So where does that leave us? Um, most of these policies do not attempt to define the term data. The NSF says data should be determined by the community of interest. Not community of practice, not epistemic community, they just kind of use community, or community of interest. But of course most of us are parts of multiple communities of interest, some of which may have some guidelines and some not. These are just a tag cloud of some things that could be data. The large ones, the observational, experimental records, and computational, those are the four that are called out in the Long Live Data Report, which was the National Science Board. And they use those to propose some policy saying that observational data, that is observations of the sky, the earth, sun, sand, stars, people, are the ones that are most important to keep because you can't recreate them. If you go sample the sand tomorrow, it's not going to be the same as the sand uh, the next day. But they don't go much, much beyond that in defining data. I have uh, posted a, a fairly long paper on SSRN called The Con Conundrum of Sharing Research Data. This is uh, so far the most popular piece I've ever written, and it's not even published yet. Um, how many of you have found this paper so far? Huh? It'll get found more. You t tweet it. It'll, it'll get out there um, quickly. It will appear in, uh, in JSIST uh, when I finish the last revisions um, on it. But what I've done in that paper is try to analyze what some of the policy motivations are for this imperative of sharing data and then positions of different cases along it. So I've come up with these two different dimensions of motivations to share and whose interests are served. On that vertical dimension is, is the driver to improve research, the top part, or is the driver to serve the public interest? And then on the horizontal is the driver for sharing research to benefit the scientists, the scholars who generate the data, or on the right-hand side is the driver to serve actual or potential users of those data? Now, let me work through four different cases that w are positioned around that, uh, those two dimensions, and then I'll try to put it back together again. Okay, first off, the one that you hear most often is that data should be kept and shared and maintained because all, all research should be reproducible, replicable, verifiable. How many of you think all research should be Reproducible. This is a bunch. Good only the good stuff. Okay. <laughs> this is a bunch of social scientists. If you talk to a bunch of physical scientists, it will say, "Well, of course, all science should be reproducible. That's why we should do this." Okay. And you're getting this from the science policy agents, particularly. But of course, the observational data, by definition, cannot be reproduced. Only the experimental data really can be reproduced to the computational ones, and those are the least important to keep because they can be regenerated again. Okay. So you've got contradictory policies going on there already. But there is a real movement 
around finding ways to reproduce and um, make research more verifiable. The second argument that you will see uh, quite frequently is this one about public money should serve the public good. So your taxpayer monies funded the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health, not so much Wellcome Trust, but certainly all of the research councils of the UK. Therefore, the public should have access to it. Now, that's the argument behind PubMed Central, but that's for depositing publications. And even then, that was a real uphill battle and many lawsuits and, and fights in, in Congress over it. Uh, if you may recall, initially this was a voluntary program where anything funded by NIH, NIH had to be deposited in 12 months. The, what, do you, what proportion do you think of those publications actually got deposited in the first year? 50%? 3.9 percent, okay. They had to make it mandatory even to get the publications into the database. Getting data in a way that it can actually be deposited is a much, much harder problem in terms of incentives and in terms of the activities involved. The third argument that you hear fairly often is one that says if the data are out there, others can interrogate it. They can ask new questions of those data. This raises that whole set of skill questions that Esther Hargitay talked about in the last section, which is, what does it take to be a scientist? We've got all of those questions about making data mobile, the kinds of things that we grew up on Bruno Latour talking about in Science in Action, is you take the data out of the context in which they were created, it's very hard to put enough knowledge around them that other people can make sense out of them. So you're loading up a number of questions around metadata, around context, around documentation, data dictionaries for other people to make sense of them. There's also a number of incentive problems that come up in this area, which is huge concerns about misuse and reuse. Think of the East Anglia, the climate data of the climate change deniers, the evolution deniers going through and trying to cherry pick data and come up with counter arguments and then saying this is the research of Oxford, Stanford, Cambridge, you name it, that says this and this and this and here's where I got the data from. The fourth one and the one I find the most powerful argument is that data curation can advance innovation. Now this is one that may sound like the same as the previous one, but it's more the notion of if you can capture the data, particularly early in the stream, and mark it up and make it useful in ways that the scientists, the scholars who created it will find it useful, then you've got a greater chance of reuse and you've got a greater opportunity to combine data from multiple sources and make other people use them for other purposes. The particular chain that I've shown here is around a NASA mission. Now, NASA is one area where when they invest in a space mission, they invest not only in the design of the instrumentation, the rocket to get it up in the sky, but they invest in the data per se. The data are seen as the product of the mission. But it takes a lot of people to do that. Uh, for example, one of the groups that we have studied in astronomy, the infrared, the infrared data has been at Caltech since 1983. The uh, Infrared Processing and Analysis Center employs 180 people just to manage NASA's infrared data of that wavelength. Okay. So great investments are being made, but this is certainly not common across other areas. Once those data exist, they can be shared internationally. We have a number of consortia like the IVOA. You can get different kinds of spectra and images out of them. And the last images of the Microsoft Worldwide Telescope where you can take these many different data streams together and use them not only for scientific purposes but for educational purposes. So now let me place those four um, different arguments on this, this map that I've given you. 
around the motivations to share versus the interests served. The first one, the reproduce and verify, would be fairly high on the research driven. Okay, so this argument very often comes up around peer review. Every, every time a paper gets withdrawn from nature or science, the question comes up of what did the reviewers know and when did they know it and what should they have known and what kind of verification should they have done. So it's definitely research-driven. It may have some benefit to the data producers because if your data, say, has been verified by some third party, maybe that strengthens the quality of your research. But it's hard enough to get peer reviewers to peer review papers, much less to get them to peer review data. There's a few areas, say, in crystallography where you got some automatic computation algorithm. There's really not that many areas where it's getting done. And it's also a potential value to, on the user side of being able to verify, but it's problematic. The second one about the public interest, that's a little dot I've got in the bottom right corner down there. It certainly flies with taxpayers and Congress and policymakers will push that point very loudly. But Saying it should be shared is actually not very useful. I mean, to, to take a spreadsheet with unlabeled rows and columns, which is the form in which we find some of these data out there, and simply post them on a website doesn't really do anybody any good, but it serves the letter of the law. Okay. So you see that coming quite a bit. You need to think um, elsewhere on the spectrum about what's going to happen. The ask new questions I put on the vertical right, that it's, it serves the data users, it's not clear how much the science. And the R4 I put in this big cloud, I didn't put uh, quite as far up because it serves both and it serves the public interest because there's so many kinds of reuse. So that, that's where I have positioned all of those. Now, the decisions you make about what the motivations are are going to drive in turn the infrastructure that we build for research data. And we're in the midst of building a very elaborate World Wide Web, semantic web, um, other kinds of bits and pieces. We've got the linked open data. We've got linked open data within individual areas. I was just a meeting where um, it was flawed for fisheries linked open data. You know, everybody's got their own. We've got the object reuse and exchange. We've got all these other pieces coming together. And we had a two-day meeting, an uh, international meeting in Berkeley just talking about data citation issues. And I'm going to talk about those more in the panel tomorrow afternoon. Uh, but we, we're going to need to make decisions all the way up and down the line. The privacy and policy issues will leave to uh, Dana and to Kate in the latter half of this session. Um, and the skills issues, I think they will deal some with as well. And we will deal with some of those more tomorrow. So where does that leave us? Um, some conclusions. One is from a research policy standpoint, you've got policymakers saying that data are intellectual pr property that should be managed and should be exploited. But whose intellectual property are they? What happens when you have collaborators? What happens when they cross jurisdictions? What happens when you run it against the Bayh-Dole Act in the U.S. that says you can patent and exploit things as opposed to the big push for open access to data and public goods? We've got uh, funding agencies who are pushing harder on the notion of research data as public assets than they are about investing in the data curation mechanisms. Libraries are concerned about unfunded mandates. It's great to say let's share it. It's quite something else to build a repository infrastructure to make them useful. <coughs> Scholarly communication, which is an area many of us in this room are doing research in, we've long looked at research data as process. If you start to think about it as product, it takes on a, a much different kind of role in scholarship overall. Publishers, on the one hand, want the data out there, but they're not quite sure how to position themselves. At first, they were trying to get the data and put it online as supplementary online materials. Then they decided that was too burdensome. They don't want supplementary online materials. And they're saying, we're not going to claim intellectual property on the data. We want it elsewhere, but they, we want you to figure out where to put it, and then you have to link to it. So they're, they're trying to have kind of both sides of it as well. They can't quite figure out. They want it, but they don't want it at the same time. <laughs> Libraries 
are again in a quandary of this unfunded mandate when you tell them that it takes 100 people just to 180 people just to run the infrared data and they think about the plethora of disciplines and data around their campuses, they say, oh my God, there's just no way we could possibly fund this. On the other hand, given that libraries can't afford most of the books and journals and they're looking for special collections, really interesting data sets are being viewed as new kinds of, of special collections. And I'm teaching a series of courses in data, data practice, and, and data curation. They're being picked off very quickly by research libraries as a new specialty. And I think that's going to be a growth area in the library world. Researchers um, don't have, in most cases, don't have a lot of incentives. There, there's many more. Um, there's many more sticks getting the data shared than there are carrots. Let's, let's put it that way. And we've got a number of studies going on about the incentives and who's actually willing to do the metadata, who's willing to do the markup. And it's generally not something that researchers are particularly good at or willing to do. Talk about a skill base. How many of you learned in graduate school how to do your own metadata? Okay. Probably not too many of us. Somebody who probably has an MLS degree. Okay, right. Okay. Um, so what, I mean, what really is going to happen is some data will be shared with some people and some of the time. Okay. Which leaves us at internet research is a whole plethora of interesting questions about our data to whom, when, why, and to what ends. Okay. Thank you. So uh, data's arrived. At last it's getting the attention that it deserves. There's lots of evidence for this. Um, in fact, it, this afternoon in London, as we speak, the, uh, the Minister of State for Universities and Science is looking at uh, potential funding for UK e-infrastructure. And the really interesting thing is that e-infrastructure would once have been defined as nuts and bolts of wires and fibres and metal. And, and now it's defined as people and data and software as well. Uh, and this is a change in the last couple of years. It's very, very important. As Christine has mentioned, in the UK, we also have a harmonized research data policy, um, which gets implemented in different ways by different <laughs> research councils. And uh, just, just last week, I was giving a talk at a research integrity conference in London for senior members of, of university. Uh, management staff on the importance of good data management and I focus exactly on the ESRC policy which from a, a funder's viewpoint is it makes a lot of sense in encouraging reuse because it's too often across many disciplines people may repeat things rather than using what was already there be it data or software uh, and it's obviously makes good sense from realizing the value of the investment to encourage reuse so the implementation of that the realization of that is quite is quite thorny but <laughs> data hasn't really just been invented. Um, it's actually been around for a while. One of the, the amusing things for me uh, is the number of times I see fourth paradigm talks. Um, so you may be familiar with the, the, the book from Microsoft by Tony Hay and, and others on the fourth paradigm, which gets presented a lot uh, with scientific audiences. And the idea is that instead of coming up with the hypothesis uh, and then doing the experiments and collecting the data, you start with the data. And that, that's a strange talk when you have a, an audience of social scientists or humanists for, for whom this is the first paradigm. What's this, what's this fourth paradigm, right? So actually, we've been doing this for a while. Um, the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK has been making a very significant uh, investment in data infrastructure for years. And this is the primary data, the first paradigm for many social scientists. Um, the other good thing, as we've heard today in, in, in all the talks, uh, is that there is a deluge of, of new forms of data as well. And now, a few years on, we are embracing that. The social science community is learning how to use that data to, to gain new understanding. So I think we really do know something about data. And this is why Christine's talk is so important, because uh, exactly as in, in the conclusions, um, re really looking at the, 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 the rhetoric versus the reality. I think there's a phrase in your paper, Christine, about revealing the dirty little secrets. Uh, and, and this is really, really important. This kind of study is essential because we need to change attitudes towards data. Data isn't just data. Data has a social life, which is, you know, which is where the sharing and the reuse comes in. 
Um, it has value. It isn't just stuff that reposes in repositories, right? which, which many people seem to think it is. It's not the size of it. It's just what you do with it, with it that counts, as we keep telling our engineering colleagues. Um, and a, a thought I wanted to, to add to today's discussion, to, for people to think about later, is also, you know, because it's not just the data, it's what you do with it that counts, then the openness and the sharing of your method and, and the process uh, is all part of this reproducibility, uh, and not just that, but sharing expertise, sharing know-how, building, and the training and capacity building. So, so there's a, another piece, especially in the digital research world, of the descriptions of what we do, which is another form of data, if you like. The, uh, the rationales and motivations for sharing that Christine has shown us are fantastic. And I'm sure those images are going to get used and reused many, many times. Um, and, and it really picks up on, on a, a vibe that's being established through many discussions now. Um, one, one way of capturing it is can't share versus won't share. And there might be reasons people can't share. You can address those, but will they then share? And I think there's a growing understanding that the key issue is about incentives and, and reward structures. Um, as, as Paul mentioned, I work in the Oxford E-Research Centre. We have 60 people working across multiple disciplines. And a little anecdote, we recently had a shortlisting meeting for a digital humanities post. And we had professors from multiple humanities departments in Oxford sitting around the table, a pile of CVs, of resumes in the middle of the table. And what was discussed as we went through those was, what data has this person produced? What methods did they use? Did they innovate in those methods? Who has reused the data? Now, that is way more sophisticated than I have seen in shortlisting for a science post. For example. I think there really is some good practice out there. That notion of data CVs, that being part of the reward structure, is really important. So I think when it comes to data, the social sciences and humanities um, are really quite sophisticated. Christine shows this sophistication in action. And uh, one of the things you've called for is, is you know, more studies to learn from the good practice and the successful experiences. So going back to the government meeting today, and Christine's second slide, the, uh, the pictures of the various reports. One of them was the RCUK 2009 report on uh, e-science. Christine was uh, one of the, the review panel for this big UK program and was a very significant contributor to the report. That report has led to the discussions that are occurring as we speak in government. So the important point here that I want to make is it's not just that Christine has studied the data and thought hard about it, but has articulated this to the community, to a broad range of communities, and has and, and shown us a way forward, uh, is actually having impact, which we all know is what matters. <laughs> so thank you very much for your talk and for all of those contributions. Yeah, I think it's best if Christine and David are uh, sitting in, uh, at the stage. And there is a microphone there, right? Okay. Who would like to uh, make a comment, ask a question, um, try out the provocation? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you for both the talk and the response. My name is Mary Graham from Indiana University, and I'm thinking about Jeff Becker and Lee Starr's work on sorting things out, and the consequences of seeing data as something um, apolitical or ahistorical without context. So I wanted to connect these, these, these two um, discussions ask you what happens then to the materials that are observational data from qualitative ethnographic researchers um, who are not producing data sets. And if, if that is the, the assessment for what makes a good scholar, what kind of data have they produced for a scholarly community, what then do we do with um, folks who are producing materials that are not reproducible or not towards that, towards that frame? Thank you. you. If you read the acknowledgments closely, you see that Lee and Jeff are collaborators of ours as well. Um, is it on? Is it turned on? Is it's only for the video. Oh, okay. Well, the video is also important. Share. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll kind of act out for you here. Um, so the, this monitoring, modeling, and memory project with Lee and Jeff and with uh, Paul Paul Edwards and Steve Jackson and David Rebus and uh, the, the usual suspects. We have been doing qualitative research and comparing a number of different large infrastructure sites. Ours is Center for Embed Network Sensing. We've looked at Waters, the Long Term Ecological Research Centers, GEON, NEON, and, and others across. And that's been one of our challenges is how do we share our own qualitative data and how do we code it in consistent ways? 
and that that itself is, has been a challenge also of, of what the code book looks like. We started this about four years ago, and our, our first research retreat was trying to, we spent two days just trying to come up with common codes in ways, and even those didn't hold up by, over the course of several years of, of interviews down the way. Uh, it, there, it's the can't and the won't, as Dave said, uh, the can't has to do with the human subjects issues and finding ways to anonymize qualitative data is even more difficult than it is with the um, qualitative, with the quantitative. Uh, but then there's other ways around it in this astronomy project that we're doing. It started on the Data Conservancy, which is one of the data net projects, and we're expanding it to others, is we've done a two-part consent form. One is your re the regular human subjects review consent. The second is an oral history deed of gift. And this Sharon Trawick is my collaborator on that. And that the deed of gift was Sharon's idea. And so far, every astronomer has been completely willing to sign off on the deed of gift, which lets, lets us deposit their interview for reuse by other people down the line. Now, how much of our own coding of those interviews we can deposit, we're working out. And in the next big grant proposal that we put into a private foundation, we build in a chunk of money and time at the end of the project just for the bit metadata management to make those more available. I mean, we're, we're trying to be as reflexive and reflective as we can on dealing with those. And that's also part of um, how we learn is by trying to do it ourselves. Uh, David, with your, because it uh, must have been an issue also in well, these. I was going to say exactly what Christine said, but, but this is a can't share, won't share issue, and there are more can'ts in, in that area. <laughs> OK, uh, person on the very, front row. Yeah, very well in Toronto. How much are scholars feeling ripped off by this? Did they put in a huge amount of work collecting, coding, <coughs> and then somebody else is grabbing it for free? Is there, I mean, that, you can't say that out loud, but you getting much grumbling Oh, yes, they can say that out loud. Yes. Uh, the big ch there's the big chunk of the paper that I didn't present is really analyzing that set of incentives and disincentives. Uh, the way some of those issues about the willingness to share are being dealt with are, uh, first of all, embargo periods. And the, the embargo periods vary from six months to five years, depending on the different agencies. And they, they try to make them of some reasonable length of time such that if the embargo period should be long enough to give people time to exploit their own data first, but short enough to discourage hoarding. So, so that's one part of it. And then there's a, a few other qualifications being let in. But when people have cumulative data, we had one fellow studying the life of marmots who said, you know, my data become more, more and more valuable over time. There's never a point at which I am done with those data. Um, Yes, that, I mean, that's a lot of it. But another, like uh, Matt Mayernick's dissertation, which just finished out of our group, is he followed four different scientific groups around to look at when they would make metadata. And they all said, we, we, don't, we know we should do it more, we know we should do it better, but who's got the time? And we'll just put out the data in whatever form it is. And a lot of times, they'll put the data out if they have to. They'll meet the letter of the law, the not spirit of the law, and literally, we have got spreadsheets with unlabeled rows and columns oh. all over the place. <laughs> so, you know, you put yeah. out there, what's the point? But there's a lot of, so you can always get around it if you don't want to. And then you've got whole other large communities which are adamant about getting good quality data out there for use and reuse in combination. Okay, we have time for a couple of two more, and then I think we need to shift to the next part of the session. Yeah, you, you first, and sure. then. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, and this is kind of a follow-up to Barry's question, about what kind of systemic changes to the tenure system and the reward system in academia and the culture of academia that might address some of these challenges. Um, so what are some kind of best practices that we can try to implement and how likely do you think they are to Yeah, very good point. Well, we're not getting any very short, short <laughs> easy <laughs> questions yeah. here. This is a very big issue. But, this is, uh, this is a huge issue, and it's one we dealt with at this data citation attribution meeting in Berkeley, and the slides are up and under the CoData website. I can point you to those if you want. It's sort of like, um, was it either Esther or Lisa this morning was saying, oh, the next generation will take care of that. Um, not happening. 
if anything, people get more conservative when they become assistant professors. They, they, they need to protect their data, and they're also not learning in their graduate work about data management. So that, I mean, that's one of the things that th there's some move is helping people learn research methods and data management. And it's absolutely necessary. I mean, we follow environmental scientists around. My, my students uh, have you know, fallen into quicksand and, and done other you know, fun things in, in following these folks around. They have spent their careers with, with buckets and stopwatches. Now they have sensor networks that are putting out data orders of magnitude more than they were trained to do. They need to learn new kinds of methods with new kinds of management. As that becomes part of graduate training, it will gradually become part of the review process. But it's, a, it's going to take a generation. I mean, we're, we're definitely at the science advancing, but one funeral at a time. OK, last question. Yes. Did you want to say anything, sir? Um, the question is also not a short one, but it's the, um, <laughs> the relationship between these NSF data rules and the whole institutional review board and ethics review boards. Because obviously we've got a, we've got a problem there. So Ooh. the question is really how they're, are, are the two groups talking to each other? Because they didn't notice anything in the NSF rules about um, privacy, confidentiality, et cetera. The, the way the, the NSF data management deals with those is around the community of interest business. The most, most of the IRBs would rather destroy data than share it. So you've got those things running at odds with each other. But you've also got IRBs that are not sophisticated in a bunch of interesting ways. And you, I mean, we work with the scientists and social science and mostly engineers around the Center for Embedded Network Sensing, and they laugh at some of the IRB stuff. The IRB cares about what lock is on the file cabinet rather than about what encryption is on the database. We've got people who are running mobile, you know, mobile phones tracking people doing urban sensing. And they do not recognize the sensitivity of that and the hoops we have to jump through to talk to astronomers about their data in comparison is absolutely incredible. So there's a, there's a real lack of sophistication on both sides and there's a number of clashes in there that are going to take a long time to work out too. So. Thank you for your interesting okay, questions. Okay, thank you very much.